everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And this is a very special episode of Mormonish. I say that every time, but this is special and a little bit different because it is a collaborative episode with our friend, Carrie Schertz, the Backyard Professor. We have joined together with Carrie and have gone on his program to discuss the gospel topic essays. And we're also going to make this available to our Mormonish audience. Our plan is to go through each one of the gospel topic essays sort of through the lens of this book called the LDS Gospel Topics Series, A Scholarly Engagement. This is a wonderful book that is full of essays written by various scholars and professors about the gospel topics essays. So we are going to take an essay each episode and dig deep. Why don't you describe to us, Landon, what this first episode is going to cover? Well, the first episode really just kind of introduces us to the book and the reason why the essays were written. And so we just go through, it's basically an introduction to the to gospel topics essays, why they were written, kind of who wrote them, and why they're important. So we'll dive into that. And then we'll follow up with all of the uh, actual gospel topics essays as we go throughout the year with uh, our friend BYP. <laughs> we love BYP. He's amazing. So we hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope that you look for all of our future episodes because there are a lot of essays to cover. <laughs> there are. <laughs> Thanks, <yep>. everybody. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome to the Backyard Professor Live Videos. I have Mormonish joining us tonight. We're going to have a fantastic night as we launch our new series of videos on the propaganda that we think is the gospel topics essays. And we are going to do deep dives on every single one of these little babies. And we're going to show you just what we mean. So let's get this show on the road. Okay, we've got a great show tonight for all of you. We are going to have an enjoyable, scholarly, interesting, exposing night tonight. Actually, you guys, we're just going to give the background of why the essay showed up. Huh? Hey, welcome to the Backyard Professor Live, both uh, Rebecca and Landon from Mormonish. How are you guys doing? Fabulous. Great. Great. Marvelous. That's what we want to hear. We decided we'd dress up for this first <laughs> kickoff into the greatest series on YouTube, we're hoping, considering the information both revealed and continually being hidden in the church essays. So my only question is, and the most important thing we have to do tonight is we have to make sure that we have our book. And so uh have you guys got your book i've got, got mine <laughs> oh carrie he's throwing the books again you guys i can't find my book <laughs> it's okay carrie we've got you covered we both have a copy you're gonna be fine but i, I gotta get my book otherwise i'm not gonna be able to participate tonight there you have it. There it is. There it is. It was in the other pile. <laughs> All right. So, hey, should we say hi to everybody? It looks like Debbie Joe is here. Nick Bowie, Newton Lemos, Dan Vogel. Yeah. Peter Higgs, Radio Free Mormon. Tim Rathbone. Troy Levitt. Good to see you, my friend. Don Smith. My gosh, everybody, Mark Christmas. Yeah, baby. Hey, I've done my yeah, baby in my dress up duds. Now, who was it you said I looked like, Rebecca? Well, I, saw, I thought you looked a little bit like Wyatt Earp, but then I thought you looked a little bit like Jack Daniels. So I don't know. I'm on the fence. <laughs> oh, Jack Daniels. I should have had my bottle so I could show Robert Boylan. I really do get drunk on that stupid stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the time we're done tonight, we may all need more than one bottle. So but the show man. gets better the more you have. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good point. However, I am noticing that as much as I'm enjoying having this total outfit on, uh, I've got to take my hat off. There we go. Yeah, now you can see my... Hey, by the way, uh, I just want to show everybody this. I actually made that headband. That's a copper leaf, and then I did the 
headband all the way around. That was back in my wonderful creative days before I begin to open my mouth and talk. And now all I can do is talk and not shut up. So were you a boy uh, scout when you made that carry? Uh, I, yeah, well, crime, it might've been, it was 20 years ago. That, that was back when I was 19, right? Perfect. <laughs> they, they called me uh, Einstein Jr. for a reason. Thank you, Debbie Joe. Yeah, it is. Okay, so here we are, and we have been kind of talking about these essays, and there is something really interesting going on with these essays, aren't there? Did you guys have as much fun reading this introduction as I did? I, I marked it all up. I've got stuff written all over in the uh, in the sides of the of these. It was it was pretty fun to listen to. I knew some of the history, but yeah, they they gave a little bit more in there that really really made it fun. Well, and I think, think it's interesting that we at first we thought, okay, well, there's an introduction, and then it gets right into the essay. So of course we'll start with the first essay. We'll just touch on the introduction, and then literally independently, we all texted each other and said, "Oh no, this introduction needs maybe even two episodes just for the introduction." So yeah, we kind of arrived at that. We have got to talk about the introduction before we even get into any of the essays. All right, so I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit, Rebecca. I don't mean to. Forgive me. I know you'll get even with me when I get I down will. there. I will. I'm notorious for that, yes. Yeah. So <laughs> what, was, what, was uh, what do you think was one of the most surprising things you discovered in the introduction? Well, well, I mean, just, okay, so I knew about the Swedish rescue. Everybody kind of knows about the Swedish rescue, but to go into that a little more, and I'm hoping that we can tell all of your viewers more about that tonight, and, and then just the sort of reluctance as survey after survey and study after study was presented to leadership for them to even begin to understand what was really happening and why people were leaving. I mean, they literally had study after study and they would look at it and go, uh, leaving because of sin, right? No, look at this study. They just refused to accept or understand the information. Their eyes were closed and yet it was so clear and they could have addressed it, I think, so much earlier instead of letting it just build and build. So to me, just time after time, not being willing to see what was right in front of them, not being able to understand, that was the most shocking part. Right. That's a good point. What do you think, Landon? What was one of your big surprises? To me, it was how much uh, President Monson knew about it. Uh, I, I hadn't realized that in 2008, he recognized it and started the Joseph Smith papers. And he, he started, uh, he wrote his book. Uh, what's his name of his book uh to, to the, the rescue, rescue. yeah the rescue. And he, evidently he had a heart attack on the way to the rescue because <laughs> he kind of started drinking root beer floats and other things i never he never really quite got it going i don't think there but uh, that was what was interesting to me is he really started the movement to try to be more transparent if we want to use that term uh he saw that it had to happen clear back in 2008 but it really took four or five years before anything really came to fruition. So I didn't realize what a big part he had in it. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a good point too for me. And, and perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to have a vendetta here, but uh, elder cooks response to all of the information that they were getting behind the scenes in committee meetings where none of the rest of us even knew about so that they were trying to get informed after cook saw how dire it was he went out in the 2012 general conference saturday morning session and we will talk about this this is the part that just really galled me to no end and he doubled down and of course, he blamed who? Us members. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and we will be able to give Elder Cook a kiss on the cheek and tell him how much we appreciate his idiotic response. So we're not going to attack the man, but we absolutely are going to attack his argument. So his argument was a little bit silly. So let's, uh, I don't know how many, Hey, fine girl. Welcome Doug Vincent. How you doing? My friend got to say hi to Doug Vincent. So why don't we jump into it? Uh, let's, let's give 
Rebecca, why don't you, yeah, why don't you start and when you get tired of talking or reading or giving your ideas, or if, if you want to get our reactions, we'll be happy to give it to you. Why don't you go ahead and start and tell us about this Swedish rescue and its significance? Yeah, I think this is where the introduction starts. It even starts with like a, a very, it's a dramatic line. On a chilly evening in November 2010, some 600 Swedish Latter-day Saints met at an LDS chapel in Stockholm. You know, it sounds very, it was a dark and stormy night, like, right? Very dramatic. So, but of course, it was Hans Mottensen, who was a Area 70, an area authority, who had started looking online, oh my goodness, that internet, and had discovered some things about polygamy. Now, if I remember correctly, and maybe you guys can help me with this, he, he was aware of polygamy, but not Joseph Smith's role, uh, the depth of that polygamy, like the polyandry and the underage. Is that more what it was? Yeah, but, but he, uh, you know, had questions. And then people had questions. And I think I would like to say that people in Sweden, they seem to be very tenacious. You know, the rest of us might just say, oh, okay, I'll try to delve into this on my own. But they were like, no, we want answers. They were storming the castle <laughs> to the point where they had to send out some representatives from Salt Lake to try to answer these questions that were flooding in from these saints. And so of course they sent out several of the apostles I'll let Landon take it from here because that's a total lie. Well, the interesting <laughs> thing is, the interesting thing is, even one of the area authorities using the internet sources realized, uh, I can't answer that. I, I mean, an area authority, I would think, the image, the impression the church gives, I'll, if I overstate this, correct me, Landon, but, but an area authority is above and beyond a state president, and certainly he would have some information and extra insight that us regular Joes would not have, right? So for him to even say, well, I love that statement. He says, uh, everything I'd been taught, everything I'd been proud to preach about and witness just about crumbled under my feet. It was such a terrible psychological and nearly physical disturbance. That's the area authorities saying that. Well, that, that's what I found interesting. I, I remember from some of the interviews Hans has done that uh, it hit people in his congregations, as he'd go to the stakes of, in Europe, they'd come up and they'd say, we, we're getting these questions that we need answered. Can you answer them? And then he started looking into him, and it's a, as an upright guy, he's going, sure, I'll try to find an answer for him. And he, he started looking, trying to find answers so he could answer them for the people, and he couldn't find anything, and it started disturbing him. And so he did what he's supposed to do. He elevated it. And my understanding, I can't remember who it was, one of the apostles actually came to one of the meetings, and he asked him about it. And he said, oh, don't worry, we've got, he's, evidently he had the manuscript of uh of a book in a briefcase and said, briefcase. we've got the answers coming. They're all coming. Just right call here. us, you know? And, yeah. and he, uh, so he called Salt Lake a couple times saying, Hey, he told me to call to get these answers. And after a couple times, the secretary told him, uh, you, you don't ask apostles these questions. There's no, you don't need to call back. And that's when things really started to go downhill in Sweden. So uh, I do have to compliment the church for finally building a rescue mission in Sweden. That's pretty, uh, I think, the first of its kind. Did we finally get a rescue mission from the church? <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah. The interesting part was there were 600 members who attended when they showed up. And it's kind of interesting that they didn't send an apostle. Uh, That's I mean, what I got, meant when I said I lied. Yeah, they did not send a, an apostle. Yeah. The general authority is asking questions. You have 600 people in Sweden. I looked up the number. There were only 9,000 members in 2010 in Sweden. That's churches numbers. So that's, you know, probably really only 4,500. And how many of those are adults? So 600 people at this meeting to, to hear these questions. And you're sending the church historians, not anybody with any authority to answer these questions. So that 600 represented a large portion. There was only four stakes at the time. So that's almost, what, like 25% of the active adults or more are at this 
at, at this rescue mission saying, please answer our questions. <laughs> and yeah. they, they can't bother to send an apostle. That's what an apostle is there for. Is he supposed to go out into the world and answer questions? But we all know they will never put an apostle in front of adults to be questioned. And that's that's maybe the no, no, what, wait, whoa, whoa, what do you wait? <laughs> they will never they will never put an apostle in front of adults to ask questions of. Yeah. How do you, how do you know that? Where are you getting that? I, well, what I'm looking at is I've, I've looked at all the times because when I was trying to get my questions answered, I'm like, where can I go and find these answers? And I keep seeing that they keep doing these question answers for youth and they keep. But whenever they go out, they tell the youth, they, they say your uh, your parents can't come and your adult leaders can't come. It's only for the youth. So well, there's no uh, red flag there to say your parents can't be involved and no other adult can be there. There's absolutely no red flag with that. No. And they make it act like, oh, it's going to be all kids. They We don't need it. We don't have room for the adults. We need to answer the kids questions. And then the kids all come with canned questions. You know, how can I be a better person? You know, and that kind okay. of stuff. But this uh, is the first time that I can think of where apostles, well, where the church actually even sent anybody out to answer tough questions. If you have the tough so. questions, they always say, this isn't the place, but they never tell you where the place is to go get them answered. So this is the first right. time they ever did that and they didn't send apostles. I just, you know, it was a big deal when they put uh, Bednar in front of the press to answer questions because you just don't question apostles. Mm -hmm. And so for them to put apostles in front of members to ask questions, I can't think of hardly, maybe someone in the audience can think of a time when they did that, but there's not many times I can think of where they put an apostle yeah, that's out to answer questions. Yeah. Well, I, I also, uh, when, when, uh, when they stood up and they, they opened the meeting, you know, and they said, well, we want you to know that we come with the, the blessing of Boyd K. Packer, and and we 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 he is working on getting getting a special committee together to provide these answers. But tonight, brothers and sisters, we can assure you that we know the gospel is true, and we know the church is true. And so, what we're here to do is give you answers tonight. And the audience got real feisty, real fast. In fact, I think that's my first slide. Let me put this up. Yeah, I love it because they basically just bore testimony and and talked about, you know, hopefully this will answer questions and your doubts will be removed. We have a testimony of this. And then the people basically said, is it okay if we ask our questions now? I mean, they just were not having it. I, I just love that. They're so I tenacious. love that. I yep. love, okay, is it time for questions yet? Yeah, We've heard it's great. From you. That's no. great. But I've got a question. <laughs> yeah. And that must have struck fear into the hearts of Jensen and Turley. Can you imagine? Because with most audiences, that would work. I just bore my testimony. You, you guys are good, right? Right? No, these guys and, were and not isn't good. Isn't it interesting too that it isn't that the narrative? Oh well, whenever you whenever you have difficulties, just fall back on yeah. your testimony, yeah. and the Holy right. Ghost will assure who you. Uh, no, no, we don't. We don't want that. Here, here was my first slide. This, you want to read that, Rebecca? Yeah, can you read that? Swedish, I well, now what are you trying to say? Yes, my reading glasses no, are really I mean, decorative. They hold my hair up, so I. <laughs> is your screen big enough? Yes, I I will lean forward and I will. <laughs> remember, what are you remember, implying, folks, Carrie? Remember, so... folks, only here on the Backyard Professor Live Channel, we are the lazy learner musketeers, right? The lazy learners. <laughs> I'm very professional on everything else I do, but not here. For some reason, I fall apart. So, I blame Carrie completely. Uh, the Swedish Rescue was designed to help people cope with internet information about the church they were finding online. It was led by LDS historian slash general authority Marlon K. Jensen and assistant historian Richard E. Turley, author of Victims, colon, The LDS Church and the Mark Hoffman Case, 1992. So these are the men that they sent to answer the burning questions. Yeah. Well, the thing that uh, the thing I realize is when uh, uh, Richard Turley was sent, I thought, oh, well, now he's actually dealt with the Mark Hoffman issue. So 
in a in a way it makes sense that he i mean he had to have learned the intricacies the in and out of how law works the ins and outs of argument and the idea of presenting evidence to make your case and what's the first thing these bumbling brethren do they bear their testimony yeah. They sure wouldn't have done that in the Mark Hoffman case. So I, I think that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So, all right. Uh, now we're told that Jensen and Turley both uh, were actually advised before they got there. Mm -hmm. They knew they were walking into uh, a lion's den, so to speak. The Swedes had had it and i i don't have the statistics i know you've been looking into statistics a lot land in this last week for the show but i i didn't bother to look into the uh i should say i didn't think to look into the uh statistics of attendance and i my suspicion is it would have alarmed him enough to send someone to sweden on a on a rescue by looking at the temple attendance that because that to the brethren is the gold standard am i wrong in that i'm not sure what they looked at but 600 out of you know out of four stakes that's a huge number and these are questioning you know these were people who had knew what the questions were when they when they showed up so there was definitely a large portion of questioning and you would think that that would until at least an apostle to show up and and be there to support uh, the the church historians, but they, nowhere to be seen. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And and the the questions they were asking, I can absolutely assure us all, was not, um, who was Nephi's father again? <laughs> Yeah, that was exactly. not the questions. That's not the style of question. This was not Sunday school. This was not where you raise your hand and repeat the answer that you know the church wants to hear from you. These were serious questions. So uh, let us let me get to this second slide just to see if this will, yeah, the meeting was fine. Now, and this is kind of me putting my thoughts into it as well. The meeting was feisty. They began bearing their testimonies, like we said. And Rebecca said, can we ask the questions now? Well, this meeting lasted for three hours, you guys. This is like a triple church Sunday on another day. And they did not take uh, breaks. The, it lasted three hours. At one point, the historian said, let's stop interrupting and go through this very, very quickly. And my comment in my margin is, oh, hell no. <laughs> no, no, there is no quick here. Had I been in that audience? I would have stood right up and I would have said, I'm not interested in quick. I'm interested in good answers. So I, I don't care to go through this quickly. I didn't come here for a 10 minute testimony meeting. I want the answers, right? And so that's why I put on here, I would have said, we, I, I include you two also. We would have said, no, we want good answers, not just quickie answers. Playing games is over. And I think that shows the impatience and right. and if they're if they're that impatient that they want the answers right then that tells you they've been looking for a long time for these answers uh that they're now saying where are they come on guys quit playing games with us we've gone to this person we've gone to this person and we're not getting answers cuz if if they just had come up with these they'd say okay let's sit back and listen but they're they're at the point where they're saying all right enough of that answer the questions yeah, well, and I also that. feel there's a quote here. Uh, there's a section where it talks about how it's very tense. You can imagine. And one of the participants who was not happy with the answers actually said, this is amazing. He said, unimpressed with uh, Turley's answers, but those are not the questions we want. So that tells me that the church again is doing that thing where you ask a question, they rephrase the question into a more palatable question for them. And then they answer that. But again, the audience was not having that. These, these are not the questions you're looking for, right? Answer what I am saying, <laughs> what I am asking. So I think they were using every tactic, whether consciously or not. Sometimes I think it is unconscious. Un unconscious. They just can't answer the question. So they kind of mentally rephrase it in a way that they can answer it. But so they were completely ignoring what the audience was trying to say. And they were having none of it. The audience was like a pit bull after those answers. Yeah, that's an excellent point too. It reminds me of uh, 
uh, Daniel C. Peterson, when on his blog, uh, when, when when something shocking would come up about the history, and I said, oh, well, I mean, we've known about that for years. I mean, I heard that back in Sunday school and all that. And finally, several of us called him out and said, we didn't. You might have, but we didn't. So we're wondering if you're just kind of, you know, promoting the false narrative to try to take away the sting of seeing the direct lies. He, he, he even tried to say that, well, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that most members who try to study just a little bit of time in their life would know that Joseph Smith stuck his head in a hat to translate the Book of Mormon through the seer stone. We said, yeah, why don't you show us the church art that hangs in the halls of the ward buildings and the steakhouses and in the temples and in the homes of 90% of the Mormons? Go ahead and show us where that's depicted. And don't tell us it's the artist's mistake. You remember when the church did yeah, that? Rogue right? artist. That's what they blame no, as if every semicolon isn't approved of by the church on any magazine or anything that's put out. There were some rogue artists that somehow got some artwork into the churches and the magazines. There's absolutely no way that ever happened. Not at all. Every brushstroke is approved yeah. by the church. Yeah, it, it, it's just it's these kind of now. Now, it's amazing. Hang on. I'm going to pull the backyard professor trick. Uh oh, he's gone again, again, Landon. Okay. We talked about we what we were going to do. This. He did this. I got to go, go pick up one of those junk books I threw, and it turns out to be valuable. Oh. Daniel C. Peterson's Offenders for a Word How Anti Mormons Play Word Games about the Latter day Saints. Well, now we're seeing that what they write about with the critics is what they are guilty of themselves. In other words, hypocrisy reigns, right? And so, as, as I did before, throw that piece of junk <laughs> propaganda away, and let's get on back to the reality. But the issue here is they want to always appear as if, well, we've been teaching that. No, you haven't. The bottom line is this book demonstrates no if they had been teaching that there would have been no church essays am i out of line with that no you're dead on they wouldn't have had to call if they were telling it as it is people wouldn't be saying why are we hearing these things that we've never heard before that's what upset people that they, they've never heard of these things before and they lived their whole life in the church hans matson's a a general authority and he hasn't authority. heard these things yep. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> Lazy learners, every one of us, right? If we can add up the hours that we sat in classes and firesides and meetings and still nothing in one ear out the other. We were lazy learners. And just remember, don't criticize, even if it's true. And that means Sunday school teachers, too, and the manuals, because they're written under inspiration. So there we go. So my big question, uh, and in fact, I think I, oh, okay, I think, I think it's, yeah, okay, here we go. It was two historians who came to the rescue, not the prophet or apostles. We've kind of covered that, but this is worth repeating. Uh, do the Lord's chosen, called special prophets and apostles care about the flock or not? They love to go into the stake meetings and have tri-stake firesides and meetings and Sunday schools and temple meetings and stuff like that, where everybody's a yes man and a yes woman and just listens to them blab on and on and on and, and feel super special and all. But when they really know we have issues, they don't show up. They send to him. Now, it's okay to be totally fair. Uh, one of them was a general authority, a, a, a church historian slash general authority, but not an apostle or a prophet. So it, it just seems like a, you know, well, why was that? We suspect they did not fathom the extent of the problem because they lack revelation. And for the Mormons who are watching this and for the TBMs who will watch this after the live is over and you want to watch the video, I'm not being sarcastic. 
Unfortunately, this whole situation points to the unerring problem that they lack inspiration. I, I don't know how much more charitable I can put this. I, I'm trying to be, you know, I'm not trying to do an ad hominem here, but this is quite serious. The untrue narrative of church history, their gaslighting, their deception with the evidence, well, we think it's catching up to them. The rescue failed. Let's understand this. Melchizedek priesthood holding gentleman of high stature in the church, the church historian and his assistant, and the church historian slash general authority and his assistant historian set apart by the laying on of hands given this very serious commission, the church historian, how does it happen? He doesn't know about these history problems when the Swedes all over their country do. That's something to think about. So we're not trying to pick on them, but we are trying to pick on them. Many tens of thousands have left the church from 2010 to today. Well, I In think other it's hard. Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, I think it's hard to receive revelation when you're in a massive confirmation bias bubble. And if you can think of the scope of that bubble when you're in the upper leadership, I think it must be ginormous. And so it's very hard for revelation to penetrate that. You literally can't look at a crack in the kingdom at all. It's not happening. I think they just didn't see it. They couldn't fathom it. And I think we'll talk about that later with some of the other people that try to break through and, and let them know what's really going on. I honestly think they just could not understand it. I, I it was unprecedented. I, I take a little different angle. I don't, I don't know. I, obviously, I don't believe it was lack of revel that I, I obviously think it was lack of revelation, but I take it a step further. I think it was a lack of courage. They didn't mm. dare go in front of those people because they knew that they had been hiding these things and they weren't going to face it. And they don't dare go and give answers to people from a point of authority that could then be used and be pointed at and say that authority said this, that's the answer he gave. And now the church has to stand behind it because that was a that was one of the apostles who answered that. And I think they're afraid to go and answer those questions because they know they don't have the answer. And so they send the minions out to do it while they stay back in the castle in Salt Lake and, and just wait for letters to come in and then they can review them and send them out when they've been reviewed by everybody and put out. They're afraid to answer people directly is what I, I see the big issue being there. And, and one other thing I did, uh, one of the questions in the comments said, did all 600 people leave as a, of the rescue mission? Um, I have no idea on that, but I did look up the numbers. Um, in, in 2010, there were just right around 9,000 members in Sweden. In 2020, when the church reported the numbers, it was 9,600. So in a decade, there was only 600, an increase of 600 members in Sweden, uh, you know, where everyone else probably doubled or tripled. So that tells you it, it, it definitely had an impact there. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, it's, it, it's, it's gone too far and yet it never got solved. And, and I think that also is such an interesting thing here. It never got solved. Now, understand, I, I'm going to, I've got to put the Mormon narrative into this because this is the narrative we were all raised to believe. This is Melchizedek priesthood holders. These guys are worthy temple attendees if not former presidents of temples. Okay, so the temple is the holiest spot on the earth. If you're temple worthy, if you faithfully attend, I can't imagine a general authority not faithfully attending. Okay, so I'm not exaggerating this. I'm trying to, I'm trying to give us the gravity of this situation of what continues to myth all the rest of us. Here we have someone who really can solve the problem, but fails. What's the psychology here, Rebecca? What, what would you think that, I mean, 
how does that, what does that do to you? <laughs> well, I don't think they really can solve the problem. I think that's the issue that they can't. I mean, unless they wanted to burn it all down and blow it all up, I don't think they can. So they're going to stick to the narrative uh, that they were raised with. And that, that I, I think the job of a church authority and apostle is to just tout out that narrative whenever asked and have people get on board. I also think there's the concept of milk before meat, right? They can oh, kind of sure. float that out there and say, well, you just don't really understand quite, you know, we know there are these authorities that, and I think people do put trust in that. They're like, oh, I don't understand. It seems really problematic. They, they've got to have an answer, right? Maybe they just can't tell us. Maybe I can't understand it. There's that idea because as we all know, trust your authority is something that's absolutely beaten into you, you know, from nursery age, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking about. I always yeah. said, you know, toward the end of my career in the church, I was a primary pianist for about 15 years because I thought that's a safe safe place, non-triggering place to be. But by the time I was done, I realized that that indoctrination of very young children, obedience, follow the leaders, trust the leaders, that is a very dangerous place to be. And they're definitely doing a work there that sets these kids on a path for the rest of their lives to never question. So I think there's some of that there that people feel there is an answer. I just don't know it. They're not ready to tell me. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Landon, you want to add anything? No, I don't have anything to add to that. No. Okay. All right. Let's go on to the next slide and see what else we can find. <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> you want... <laughs> <laughs> Who of us I'm just wants picturing to how this worked. Like, okay, there'll be a hand yeah, out at the back. Everyone go to the door. I mean, <laughs> I'm just picturing like passing out the program. Get oh your, it's just, it's, <laughs> Landon, you want to read this? Absolutely. I'll read it. I've got my glasses on. Uh, so, uh, right. The historians brought a handout recommending five faithful church websites to go to. They came with Elder Boyd K. Packer's blessing. Why didn't Elder Packer come himself? <laughs> The Swedes were told to look to faithful websites, not anti-Mormon websites. Why do that when it's blatantly obvious the faithful websites are deceiving about the history of what really happened? Now, here, here's the key. Now, we're jumping the gun just a little bit, okay? So we don't have the essays yet, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they're bringing in this, this pamphlet saying, well, you guys are looking too much at the anti-Mormon websites. Let's understand what they mean by that. Um, when faithful, temple-attending, church-attending, tithe-paying members would somehow run into information on the internet, and they would see it can begin completely innocently, just exactly like Patrick Mason told John DeLynn in that fabulous interview between him and John. I think they had like three sessions together. It was one of the best Mormon stories podcasts of all time. I actually did a commentary on it too. When they come in and they innocently find out that there are four or five or six different versions of Joseph Smith's first vision. What? What? <laughs> Where does that come from? In Sunday school, we've always just been told he saw God the Father and Jesus. And, you know, um, I got to look into this. And that's where it begins, right? But the anti Mormon websites are the former Mormons who couldn't get the answers from the leaders because they said, well, a variety of responses, right? Well, you got to have more faith, brother shirts. Well, brother shirts, that's not pertinent to your salvation. Don't worry about whether there's four or five different first vision accounts or whether the book of Abraham actually does translate out of the Egyptian on the papyri. Just what you need to do is stay with the basics, you know, and keep paying your tithing and stay faithful because that's not pertinent to your salvation, but the core material is. Now, that's part of the faithful narrative that Richard Bushman spoke out against and said the narrative is not true. So the anti-Mormon websites are our other Mormon friends and neighbors so again, we see this psychological ploy, and, and if it's not this, 
I will apologize to the church leaders, but this is what it appears like. So you need to do a different method is what we're all trying to say here tonight. Your method is faulty. It sucks. Can I be that bold? I have to be. Your method sucks. And you better so, throw a book right now, Court. You got to. Come oh, on. Oh, no, that's Dan Vogel. I won't no, not that one. Oh, he's Dan. like hugging his books. Look how cute he is. So, well, I have a theory about this kind of. So in the sure. past, anti-Mormon literature, you'd have to go to a dark alley and someone would hand you a pamphlet, right, about horses in the Book of Mormon. So everyone says it's the internet, right, that kind of brought everything forward. I don't believe it was necessarily the internet. I believe it was the smartphone. Because think about the era right there. All of a sudden, you know, you're at church, you hear something, you used to go home, you'd fiddle around, try to find something on the internet. You're at church, you hear something, you go, oh, what? I mean, it's right in your hand that real time, you can look up information. I believe that that really, you know, catapulted people questioning into the stratosphere. You had access to it right there. So that's my theory. It's the smart. Excellent insight. What do you think, Landon? No, I, I agree. Uh, we've had that discussion several times and she's absolutely correct. I know that the, the, the church websites were actually one of the breaking points for me when I was doing studying because I could go to the anti-Mormon websites looking for answers and I could ask questions and people would come back and they'd comment and they'd put references and they'd tell me where the answer could be found. And then I'd go to the church ones and they wanted me to log in and then they'd say, oh, we'll get back to you with that and we'll send it back. Like they had to go research it and make sure that they didn't put anything out that that could. And I was going, whoa, I can't. Even and you had to give your membership number membership and you had to give yeah, your kids like names and those things. Wait, yeah. wait you, for real. They had you. I've never tried. Yeah, they there were some of the ones that I went to. You couldn't you couldn't ask. A, you had to submit the question. Yeah. And then they'd respond later, you'd get a, an answer. So they, they After basically they would, found out who your bishop was. And they didn't want to know, they didn't want to know who, they didn't want to know, uh, they didn't want the other people to see your questions. You had to submit it, you know, you didn't get to post it where everyone could see it. You had to submit oh. it and then they'd post an answer to it later on the site because they didn't want you putting questions in that other people could respond to. So the anti-Mormon websites I could go to and there'd be a whole conversation and people giving answers back and forth. The, the pro-Mormon ones were not that way. There was no method really to, and, and I can't say all of them were that way, but but most of them were that way where they'd really limit how you could ask a question and how they responded to the question. And, and oh, I also that. think I've always been impressed and Landon and I have talked about this before when you are on a, you know, a post-Mormon site, boy, if you make just a generalization or a comment, they're like a mob all over you. Where's your source? What do you mean? Who told yeah. you that? I mean, they're not putting up with it. You know, you can't be vague. You have to have sources. And I respect that so much that, that they are absolutely, they must have the correct information and they won't accept it without it. And you don't see that on the faithful sources, uh, the faithful sites, but post-Mormons, absolutely. They'll go after you. It's happened to me. <laughs> yeah. And, and make no mistake about it. If you get too close, they're going to accuse you of getting drunk. I have that on a bit of thought. Oh dear. Oh dear. Here we go. <laughs> well, in all fairness, Carrie, you do act that way most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I have accomplished my mission. <laughs> That's it. He's drunk <laughs> on knowledge, everybody. It's hard to tell. It's a fine line. Knowledge. <laughs> Is it any wonder I love you too? Yeah, I, you know, I tell people at work too. I say, look, you guys, if we can't laugh for a couple of minutes at work or something, we really are doing something wrong. That's you right. Know, you got to have a little, little bit of fun and laughter. So I love it, man. That's awesome. So. Let, let's let's head off to the next one. Just okay, okay. And this one is is one. Uh, Boyd K. Packer was putting together a committee. You see, and the idea with this committee, of course, is so that we can create answers. Get this, create answers. Why would they even have to do that, especially to the difficult questions? Now, the reason I'm going to make a big whoop to do about this, not a big whoop to do, but a whoop to do, um, my experience, and, and I know all households were, mine is not the base from which to make a judgment, right? But I have no other base with which to make a judgment with, except my own experience at this point in time. 
I was raised till all the way after my mission in uh, that the brethren were guided by Jesus Christ, the Savior, uh, the creator of the universe. My dad loved that feature about Jesus through the power of the Father, through the name of the Father, however you want to look at it. Jesus is the one that was the absolute, look up in the stars, son. That is Jesus's work. I mean, just a carpenter on earth, but man, did he graduate to beyond PhD in the cosmos, right? This theme, this grandeur of Jesus knowing everything, well, he met with the apostles every Thursday evening in the upper rooms of the Salt Lake Temple. Now, my dad just was, he was like a kid getting Christmas gifts on Christmas morning when he was eight. When he saw me, he was giddy. It was embarrassing when he saw me with Talmadge's Jesus the Christ when I was a teenager and I was looking into it and reading it a little bit. I, <laughs> I couldn't understand it, but I did have it open when he came home, right? And he was just beside himself and he said, you know, I've taught you that Jesus meets with the, and I said, well, of course, yes. And he goes, do you know who this is? And I said, no, I have no idea. And he goes, this was one of the apostles' son. And he said, this man wrote this book about the Savior in one of the upper rooms of the Salt Lake Temple. That book is close to Scripture. Now, now with this type of a teaching, the question is, how, how can the apostles today, after, without any inspiration ahead of time, but, oh, hey, ding, 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 we've got a crisis over here in Sector 5 in Sweden. Oh, well, we're going to create a committee to answer difficult questions. Did Joseph Smith create committees all the time before to answer questions? Or did he just go to the Lord and, ta-da, after 200 times, what do we have as proof that that's how he solved the problem? The Doctrine and Covenants. So, so I'm not trying to over-exaggerate this, but realize the oddity here. He said, we're going to get a committee to create answers to difficult questions. We want you to know tonight that there are answers. And if I had been in the audience, I would have stood up vehemently. I would have raised my hand. I would have said, that's not good enough. Because we don't want answers. You're missing the point, brethren. You're not here to give us answers. We want the truth. That's the difference here. I don't think the brethren got that. And why a committee when prophets, seers, and revelators are supposed to, yeah, I've already said that, be able to have Jesus himself tell the answers. Why this turn toward the arm of flesh? So, Landon, would you like to yeah, do you have I, any ideas on that? I came across the exact same thing, and they said they said they were working on position papers, and I was like, position papers. If I want position papers, I'll read the Kama Sutra. This is this is we're talking about. It's already established. We don't need a position paper. Where are we going? I ship my hat to that. <laughs> Wait here. I think I have it right. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with you. I thought this was already established doctrine. This is stuff I was teaching on my mission that we're questioning now. It's already yes. established. Why are we just now coming up with a position on it? I, I didn't yes. get it. So, yes, I already taught this stuff. What are you talking about? <laughs> I have been teaching this, and now you're. I'm finding contradictions that you never let me in on, man. And now I look back and I go... I baptized people on my mission with a false narrative. Do you not get how pissed that makes me? And I guess they don't. Rebecca? They don't. I'll, I'll tell you what I think, though. It's because okay. the kids are all grown up. The kids are all grown up. The members are all grown up. They used to be satisfied with the answer like a child because I say so or because it is. Or don't ask that question, right? But then the kids grow up and they are not satisfied with that answer. And they go out looking 
or the real answer. And they're not going to let you off the hook. Anybody that's had teenagers know that the answers don't work. You've got to outsmart them. Absolutely. Good so point. I think it caught leadership off guard. The kids are all grown up and now they're scrambling because they want answers and they're smart. They're smarter, I think, than the leadership. So they're definitely oh. in trouble. And what are they going to do? They're going to create a committee to create answers. That's the key word right there. They're not going to answer. They're going to create the answers. Create answers. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Let's move on. I'm going to start saying stuff I'm going to regret if I'm not careful. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll have more times to deal with this. So Landon, you want to read this one? Yeah, I've got sun shining on my screen here. So let me make sure I can read it. You're literally oh, glowing. Yeah. Like you're That's having right. a celestial <laughs> experience. All Tell kinds of people are losing. I, I think I can do it. All kinds of people were losing their faith. The regular Mormons, bishops, Relief Society presidents, even general authorities, such as Matson, were bewildered, not having been told of the actual and very real problems of polygamy, Revelation, Book of Abraham, the black skin curse, priesthood restoration, rock in a hat, this stunk to high heaven and rightly so. Now I want you to notice something here, you guys. And I'm I, I know you you notice, but let's let's rethink we have polygamy one, revelation two, book of Abraham three, the black skin curse four priesthood restoration five rock in a hat six where do we flip and stop where's the safe harbor absolutely everything is up for questioning now what the hell happened between our teenage years and now because we never had all of this. I mean, everything was it all. Grand Richards, every general conference showed how beautifully, logically consistent and interwoven the gospel was with the doctrine and the scriptures. And it's the most beautiful, perfect system. And now we can't find one or two cogs to even match anymore. What is going on? That's what the brethren were facing. Well, and I know people that miss that simplicity. I mean, if you really take the narrative as it was presented, it is a beautiful and simple story. It really is. I like to think my grandparents, you know, they've passed away. They lived a life based on a beautiful and simple story. They went on trips to South America. They saw the temples of the Nephites and Lamanites. They felt inspired. They came home and told us grandchildren. It was beautiful. And they passed away with that beautiful story. They never knew anything might be amiss at all. So, but we're just, I don't know, maybe a little more critical thinker. I'm not sure there's a difference though, but I know people that miss that narrative because it worked. It worked to a certain point. Yeah. What do you think, Landon? I know as I went on my mission, you know, I know some of the things they talked about was like first vision and they'd say, oh, the first vision, there's, there's multiple accounts, but it's okay because it adds to the story. It develops it more. And I'm going, well, then why didn't you tell me before I went on my mission so I could have shared that with all the people I went out and, and told this to? If it if it did that, I would have thought you would have told me that. Now you're telling me only after I find it out. Now you want to say, oh, it adds to the story. And now you want to give all these reasons for why it happened. I felt horrible that I had taught those things to people and they believed those things because I believed them and I hadn't been told the truth. It really bothered me. Yeah. And, and we'll read accounts of other people who actually reacted as well. Definitely. Yeah. So, so on, Oh, and this was Landon, you you want to read this, Re Rebecca, and then Landon will explain it because he's the one that discovered this. This is yeah, awesome. this was absolutely great. Did we already cover the slide that you just went past? We did, didn't we? Okay, I just wanted to make oh, sure. That hold I on, that. hold on. Let me double check. Double check it really quick. Yes, we did. Okay, yep, perfect. That's good. Losing track. Too much. Very fun. Good. Okay. So, as of April sixteenth, twenty twenty three, the ex Mormon Reddit has ballooned to 270,000 subscribers. Now, these are people that have taken the time to actually create an account and subscribe specifically to 
this Reddit. This doesn't probably take into account the people that just visit it, you know, surf it, but don't, you know, aren't going to get on it. So Landon and I were curious about what this actually meant because that's a big number. It's hard to wrap your head around like 150 billion. So we thought, what does this mean in like terms LDS could understand? And so this is equivalent to 900 wards and 90 stakes, which is literally half the stakes in Salt Lake County. This is just English speaking members. So that kind of gives you a sense of the people. And this is just one post-Mormon platform. There are so right. many others that people go on and, and podcasts that they subscribe to, all those. So uh, that's a massive number. Don't you think, Landon, when we discovered that? It was huge. So yeah, we wanted to that. put that in to kind of give an idea of how many that really was or how big of impact that is in the church, not just a number. And so, you know, I went through, I looked at the numbers from what makes up a ward and the average was about 300 people for a ward, 3000 for a stake. So when we divided those numbers up, you know, wow, 300 wards worth of people are on yeah. ex-Mormon right now. And, you know, some of those are ex-Mormons. A lot of those are PMOs or people who are still in who want to be out. And, and like we said, that's only people, probably mostly people in the United States. Obviously, it's in English. So you, you have to be English speaking. You might be from the UK or that. But think about the people in South America, how many people that speak Spanish that aren't even included in these numbers. And that's like like Rebecca said, that's one platform. It's one the platform. biggest platform, but it's it's one platform. And it's it's just taken over. The, the rock is rolling forth, as the scripture said, <laughs> but it seems to be rolling it's the disintegrating as it rolls. <laughs> it is, well, and we, bring it up, <laughs> we bring it up because in the book, which was published in... When was uh, this book published? Yeah, I can't 20, remember. Uh, we should know this. 2020. Yeah, yeah it, it 50, said 50,000. So that tells you how fast that rock is rolling forward. Well, the, that's a beautiful point. That was yeah. really good. Yeah, the book itself. Yeah, I think it that. said 50. Yeah, it was a very it's small beautiful. number. I mean, they, they put it in the book to say, wow, look at this. But it's gone far that beyond that. Years, so. Two and a half years ago, less than two and a half yeah. years ago. Now, yeah. from my point of view, too, uh, when I joined uh, Reddit, the the ex Mormon Reddit, uh, it's it's been a while. But when I joined it, it was at twenty three thousand. And when I I participated for a little while, and and uh, then I went to reading only. And now I, I I will look in on it periodically from time to time. Yes, you know, once a month or so. Uh, and but from the time I was active on the ex Mormon Reddit, it went from 23,000 to a hundred thousand. And yeah. that wasn't that long. Now here's the thing in between the time I was involved with it, all of the rescue missions, the Swedish rescue mission, the Boise rescue mission, uh, there was a British rescue oh, mission, no, 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 I yeah, think, yeah. fairly recently, and they sent whichever apostles had served their missions there. I think Holland and Nemo. Somebody else. Nemo would have been that apostle, yeah. right? Nemo. Yeah. Yeah, Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Nemo, yes. Captain Nemo, my man. Uh, yeah. So, so, and this is like you were saying, Landon. To me, I don't recall anything. I'm in my sixties. I seriously don't recall anything like this ever happening, ever. And I found three those missions, three missions in what a decade and yeah. nothing's Nothing. working. You yeah, found, I found, them, I found the numbers. It was 2012. They had 5,000. Okay. Four, four years later in 2016, they had 50,000. So it, okay. it increased 10 times in four years. And now here in 2023, we're at 270,000. So. Oh, so yeah, somebody in the chat like just. Sorry, somebody in the chat just reminded us that, yes, that was when Holland let it slip about the second anointing, the British rescue. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, that's said, Mo Sia. That that's, was huge. That's yes. My good friend, Mo Sia, Yeah, Mo no, that was quite, that was a pivotal event. <laughs> good, good call, Mo. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Very excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, The, the, uh, the momentum. Uh, what I'd be often saying, it shifted and what we're seeing. And don't we notice this in general conference too? Uh, not that any of us watch it. I do so I can make good comments on it. But but um, I think I do. 
I sleep through half of it still when I'm trying to, you know, but um, they're on the defense. It, it just appears to me they're books and, and we've got a whole list. In fact, let me, I'm going to break protocol here. You guys, sorry, please forgive me. Uh, let, let's look over on page 11. We're going to jump ahead just a little bit. I can segue into this really good. Yes, we're only on page 11 after one hour. That's <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're making great progress. <laughs> That's there's how only, we roll. <laughs> there's only 220 pages, so we're good. But listen to the number of books and their titles. This is remarkable. This is remarkable. The Grand Richards never published a book with titles like this. Bruce R. McConkie never published books with titles like this. B.H. Roberts, whom unfortunately General Conference threw under the bus, the morons, this last conference, never had titles like this. Listen to these titles and listen to how many of them there are. Th this kind of, wow. So, in 1998, Deseret Book, DB, I'll call it, the Church's Press published answers, straightforward answers to tough gospel questions. Straightforward answers to tough gospel questions. Why in the hell can't we just have straightforward truth? But instead, we have to now have books saying, well, okay, we've been a little problematic. Now we're going to give you, now we're, trust us, gentlemen and ladies, now we're going to give you the straightforward answers. Okay, I'm hamming it up a little bit. Six years later, getting at the, getting at the truth. This a church book, folks, church book, published by the, getting at the truth. I thought we had the truth. I thought this was the one true living church am i no it's ongoing yeah. haven't you gotten the memo it is ongoing <laughs> getting at the truth responding to difficult questions about les beliefs and then this was followed by no weapon shall prosper new light on sensitive issues i have that one and that is really a good book i'm going to be doing a podcast using some of that materials uh brian Hoglund has a great chapter in that that was as he was beginning to transition and he lets it slip in his article I, i've got some stuff coming up on that the crucible of doubt this is terrell gibbons reflections on the quest for faith planted that's our good friend patrick mason belief and belonging in an age of doubt a reason for faith now that one was uh What's her head? Um, and unfortunately, she just died. Uh, anyway, um, oh. Hales, Sister Hales. I, 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 I don't know if it was Brian Hill's wife or not. I, I hope not, but I'm afraid so. But she, she wrote the book A Reason for Faith, navigating, navigating LDS doctrine and church. We have to navigate it now. Do they know what navigating implies? right? And then we have letters to a young Mormon in 2018. And then they rely on apologetic websites like Fair Mormon, which is the best anti-Mormon recruiter on the internet, is what I have heard dozens of people say, right? Then uh, the Interpreter Foundation, which is only second to Fair Mormon in showing people how utterly ludicrous the times have become, and the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at BYU. And the amazing thing is, they now have 14 essays addressing all of the same stuff they've been trying to address for the last decade in all of these books. And not only that, they have now come up with an entire new series of thicker books than the essays called Let's Talk About, where they are picking each one of the subjects of the essays and expanding it, trying to answer the criticisms that the essays have received. That's astonishing. The church is entirely on the defense. They are not proclaiming the truth. What do we hear them say? Stay in the boat. Where will you go? I loved Reddit's response to that. They had thousands, tens of thousands. I'm almost not exaggerating. Of pictures, 
photos of people showing where they went on Sunday. Beaches, forests, mountains, ocean, ocean uh, picnics. I, it, was a it was hilarious, and yet it was actually vital. So I think it's interesting when you read these titles. Seeing... Go ahead, Carrie. Sorry. I was just going to ask you guys, am I missing this that I think the shift from offensive, hey, we have the truth, come and join us, to, oh, hey, wait a minute, it's not as bad as you think it is. Is that not a shift on the onto the defense? Yeah, it is a shift. And if you look at these titles of these books that you just read and you kind of pull out some of the phrases, tough questions, difficult questions, age of doubt. I mean, it's just... You know, they're saying it right there. <laughs> that is what is happening. You know, and of course, they're trying to offer a, a remedy to that, a placebo maybe. Um, but they're definitely saying it. We're in an age of doubt. We're facing tough questions. We have difficult questions. It's almost like the titles are a cry for help. Interesting. I wonder where Jesus is. I'm not saying that facetiously anymore these days either. So, yeah, no. Here is one of the most important things. Now, can I? Um, the backstory, just real briefly, and then we'll get to this. The backstory is the uh, the essays came about because not only the faith crisis, that's true, but the general authorities were not getting it. You have a serious problem. So John DeLynn and another gentleman named Stratford did a survey of Mormons, and, and I mean a big one. No, it wasn't scientific, but they had 3,086 responses. That's a pretty good response, you know. And they, they basically described what their particular personal problem was. And so with that in mind, John DeLynn was a big part of this shout out to my good friend John DeLynn. This is not a crisis of members wishing to leave in order to sin. It wasn't a crisis because the members haven't been studying their scriptures and they don't want to. It's not a crisis that they haven't attended the temple enough and have lost their spirituality. The really amazing thing is these surveys conducted demonstrated unequivocally that members were losing faith because of doctrinal contradictions, because of blatant misrepresentation of historical situations, an outright deception from church leaders' teachings. Uh, that seems pretty significant. What do you think, Landon? Absolutely. The number one thing that killed me was when, you know, I keep reading through there and I go, oh, they're just learning about this. These guys must just be finding out about this. And then the deeper I dug as I started to learn that this goes back all the way, you know, Joseph uh, was it Joseph Fielding Smith who cut out the, the first vision accounts. He knew about it. He the knew it. Abraham. I'm teaching here. I am teaching. Uh, I'm teaching early morning seminary when I lived up in Washington state and I'm teaching that to the kids and I'm teaching them that the scroll of Abraham burned up in the Chicago fire and the church has it sitting in their vault since 1950, whatever, when it was refound in the metropolitan museum, I'm going, why don't I know this information? They never they, updated that in the seminary manuals. Never. And, and this I is, never heard about any of this stuff until I was home from my mission and found it in the Hugh Nibley articles in the improvement era. And, and this is 40 oh, years after it, after it had been found and it, the books can't be updated in 40 years to present this kind of information. And here I am giving it to the kids, telling them this and the church has it the whole time. I've never heard of a rock in a hat and I'm teaching the kids about how he translate the book of Mormon. By Here's the gift and power of God. no less. And the Urim and Thummim, the glasses or whatever, you know, but that he's looking at them and, it was all lies and they knew it and they were putting these out. And that was the, because the one thing I could say, I could always say, okay, no one knew we're learning this stuff, but when they did know and they hit it, that is the most unchristlike, the most unholy thing you can do is lie to the people to make them believe something. And that's when I just said, whoa, this is too much. I've been lied to. 
Now it's personal. Now it's not just something I'm learning and I'm growing out of it. You deceived me with this information and now it's personal. You became Satan to me. <laughs> you are the deceiver now. You are not the Ooh. Christ. <laughs> so. Ooh, very Landon, good. Landon, it's getting spicy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Throw that cayenne on there, baby. I'm gonna run <laughs> That's right. That's right. But you make a you make a terrific point, man. Um, and then of course, now you're doing it unbeknownst. So yours is not a sit of commission, but you in turn become part of the problem because you're teaching. Yeah, true. It's in ignorance. Believe me, we're all in that boat, yeah. right? Until God discovered the internet and inspire the non-Mormon to invent it. That's pretty nice. For the purpose so, of genealogy. That's the only reason. It's so perfect for genealogy. Yep. And family yep. history. That's why. Yep. Okay. So now, and, and this was quite the reaction, uh, the shock at the incredibly huge numbers of people. And these aren't just typical Joes like I am. These are PhD historians and other well-educated Mormon professionals. I mean, doctors, lawyers, uh, everybody caused Jensen, Marlon K. Jensen, to lament our best and brightest are leaving the church. Now, if I understand this correct, uh, this was a private meeting and, and it so shocked him. And someone leaked that out to the Washington Post and they published it. And Marlon Jensen got talked to about saying about being a little bit too loose with his words. But anyway, that leadership is entirely unaware of this in 2010, raises the question of complete lack of inspiration and revelation from Jesus on their part. Did it matter to Jesus? Obviously not. And I'm not trying to be a snot nose here, I promise. But let's think of the Mormon theology. They are the one talking about, oh, well, we have revelation today. Well, who's giving them the revelation? It dang sure ain't Krishna. So allow me to make this point with Jesus. Is it important to Jesus? No, since he's never told church leaders of this problematic issue. The actual question that so many of us want to know is, well, where is Jesus then? I thought it was his church. I thought, he guided the brethren with, guess what? Ongoing restoration. Now, Landon, you you have a small correction to that that I would like you to bring in, bring up. Uh, I, I did not get this bottom part exactly correct. My date, 2010, is off a little bit. Yeah, 2008, uh, President Monson actually was aware of it, and he started the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Then uh, right. he started a he started a few of these uh, attempts at at uh, making things more transparent and trying to be more truthful in the history. Um, so he started that in 2008. A lot of the stuff didn't come out until you know later 2010, 2011. But the church, but the leadership was definitely aware of it by 2008 because that's when Monson uh yeah. started all these projects. Well, I was I was a couple of years off. I just don't want to give the Mormons a chance to say see the backyard professor doesn't know what the heck he's saying. Now that's probably true anyway. I just don't want the Mormons to say that. <laughs> 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 okay, let's let's go to this Rebecca, do you do you have Comment? You know, I don't have a comment because RFM is distracting me by texting me and telling me that President Nelson has died, which he has not. So <laughs> knock it off. I'm That's, trying to focus. President Nelson has died and the backyard professor is drunk again. <laughs> and the last days are I'm here. sorry. Although maybe RFM has some inspiration that we don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. But yeah. So Okay. Well, in that case, over Nelson's dead body, we will read this next. Uh, there next. you go. Great now, segue. In this, in this one, I mistyped this. The other one, I was wrong historically by a couple of years. But in 2022, I wrote 2022. I meant in 2012. Uh, Jensen was at the University of Utah. So this is two years after this Swedish mission in 2010. Two years have gone by. And he exclaimed that the information being found on the internet was not flattering to the church. Well, no 
kidding, cowboy. <laughs> of course not, because it was true information, not the kind the church spewed out for decades upon decades, presenting a faith-promoting version of LDS history. This was not serving the church very well now, no kidding. Not since Kirtland, Ohio, the 1830s, have we seen such an exodus of the church's best and brightest leaders. Now, I think we three here would agree that we're willing to add members, too, onto that comment. So as of 2023, leaving the church has far surpassed what happened in the 1830s. So Houston, we have a problem right? And NASA solved their problem. How did they solve that problem? With the get down on it, get truthful quick, or lives were going to be lost. Now, lives have been lost with this church problem. And it doesn't seem to me like the brethren, I hope I'm wrong. I'd love to be wrong. But the brethren don't seem to care. There have been lives lost suicides because of the stance of some of the policies. There have been a lot of <sighs> doubt. Now, is it Satan causing the doubt? I, I was actually told that once. That's why I'm bringing this up. Um, I'm not trying to be facetious here. Oh, well, Satan is really tempting you, and you're giving in to Satan. You need to come back to church so that you can get the spirit back. Well, wait a minute. Satan is the father of all, not condoms, he's the father of all lies, right? Damn it, man, there's that word, lies again. It is the Mormon lies that's giving us our doubts. But they're pointing fingers at everyone else. So, yeah, just, It's the evidence that is giving the doubt. Yeah. The, anywhere you go, the evidence is clear. That what we were told is not true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In, in yeah, fact, I had a, well, sure. I was going to say, Landon and I interviewed. Um, no, I think it was Steve Pinder and I interviewed. So I can't remember where she said this, or was it Landon and I? Anyway, we had a guest, and she said that when she was a TBM, she thought that anti-Mormon literature or websites were places where people just made fun of Mormons. You know, made made light. She said, I was stunned when I went on to some of these sites and it was just history and it was just truth. You know, and I thought that's very telling. That's exactly what it is. It's simply the facts. So and I also think it's interesting. The church is a corporation, as we know. So any corporation in the world, if they discovered that a large percentage of their consumer base was exiting quickly, they would have board meetings. They would talk about what they could do differently. They would never blame the consumer and say, we're going to keep doing exactly what we're doing and it's their problem. So to me, that it's so interesting that they've just doubled down when it's obvious the mass exodus is happening. It's an interesting, I don't know, head in the sand kind of scenario. There's a weird psychology at play in the mm -hmm. leadership, isn't it? Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. My suspicion, honestly, just off the top of my head is I, I, it's inevitable. Money has to have something to do with that, but it won't be all of that. But I mean, yeah, there, there's a warped psychology going on. Hey, let me read from page 19 real quick. Uh, something that just now caught my eye because of the comment I wrote in the margin. Uh, Marlon Jensen as church historian and recorder in 2012. I'm right up at the top of the page 19. Uh, as historian and recorder in 2012, noted that the essays will provide a series of answers that will help our members better understand these chapters in our history. The gospel topic essays, he further explained, will provide Latter-day Saints with answers to difficult gospel questions. General authority now, Paul B. Piper, added that the essays would strengthen their testimony and deepen their conversion. And my comment in the margin is, all you care about is belief and testimony. We want truth and reality. Am I off? Well, I think, I think that statement is, uh, is not true right there. <laughs> because if they really believe that they would strengthen people's testimony, why don't they come out in general conference and, and 
breed these and make talks about these? Why are they hidden? Why can you hardly find them? Why did they only roll them out to uh, the C to the CES uh, leaders and to a Utah regional uh, conference, not to the world? They specifically have said we uh, this is a soft rollout. We're not going to publish these, and they've effectively pushed them to where only in an emergency, it's kind of break glass when there's a fire. But you know, when you're when your testimony is about to be destroyed, break glass and read the gospel topics essays. And by that point, you're too far gone. You you can see that that there's not truth in the essays itself. But I think the very statement that they they're they're playing you. They're saying, oh, it's going to be faith promoting. It's just like when you go to the temple and they all tell you what a wonderful thing this is. And so you start saying, oh, it must be a wonderful thing. Everyone's saying it is. They're going to say these are faith promoting, so that everyone says they are. But when you read them, they're really not. Yeah, brilliant insight. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fabulous. Yeah, because they really don't strengthen my testimony. And and as we go through every one of the essays with this, there's no testimony strengthening going on. We're going to unfortunately discover that the hiding and the manipulating of the history and the uh, they don't bring out the consequences to their fullest measure. Uh, show us that these essays uh, just don't cut the mustard. These don't save the droids you're hoping they save. Sorry. <laughs> We're already gone off into the sands of Tartuin, wherever the heck we went. So now this was, uh, this was, uh, Okay, we did that one. Uh, let's go yeah. to this next one. Okay, okay, Rebecca, would you like to read this one? Sure. This one. Okay. This yes. is really important from our stance. Okay, so betrayal is the problem. Why does the true church lie so often about every facet of its history if it is actually the truth? That literally is senseless. It's stupid unless they know something they want to keep secret. What would that be other than that is not true? And Joseph Smith was a charlatan and he invented all the stories of the Book of Mormon, Book of Abraham, the Joseph Smith translation, etc. What other reason could there possibly be other than it is false? And, and the reason, th these were some of my thoughts that I just put into this, but I'm sincerely not trying to be anti-Mormon with that entire slide i really think putting the finger on the pulse and you've already said this landon is and we all have we taught this stuff for crying out loud we were teaching it to impressionable kids we were teaching it to youth who were struggling and so we bore fervent holy ghost bearing testimony from the warmth of our hearts to the youth at the youth camps that we took them on as leaders that this church is true and that's why we get to come up here in the beautiful mountains and have fun and sled down the hills in the snow and have great camaraderie and then at night we get to all bear our testimonies to each other on how true this is. Do you really think we leaders would stick through the thick and thin in life if this wasn't true? Here we are, and you can be too. We're all one big happy family. I mean, it literally goes on unending until you begin to read. Isn't that crazy? Um, what do you think, Landon? <laughs> no, I, I agree 100%. That's, it's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, and the problem is, well, the blessing is, I'm, I'm going to, uh oh, hold on. My heater just kicked up. Hold on. Uh oh, he's leaving again. <laughs> the, so landed. They, they turned the heat up on him. <laughs> Did you ever I'm think it would be like this when he invited us I'm on? leaving <laughs> again. But I brought back a terrific chess book, Gary Cosper Fisher. I'm just oh, saying. that is I a good book. Oh, that's don't throw that one. That's a good one. If you like chess, that's the book. So, yeah. so anyway, what was I lying about? Um, okay, you read that the trail. One. Yes, I just read that. Yeah. One. Okay, now, and and here is something else that's really interesting. A report from the Washington Post in 2012 said Mormonism is being besieged by the modern age. Let me be clear. No. 
It's being besieged by the truth. It has hidden itself from everyone, which makes people wonder, is that how a true church would function through lies and deception? Now, frankly, can the church not realize that it is wrong? It's the wrong way to go about spreading the truth by telling lies. I, I mean, really? You're grown men, you church leaders. Come off it. Is it so bereft of intelligence and revelation that it resorts to that method? See, here's the question. Is the, the label is shot. It doesn't work anymore. Is it anti-Mormon to note the lies and the deception? See, why does the church use this method? There's a lot of methods you can use. Why are you picking this one? Is it that the truth of it is ugly and demeaning? Now, when I wrote this, the reason I wrote this is because I had been browsing in the essay, which we will be able to do a huge deep dive. And Rebecca, I'm so looking forward to getting your insights as a woman on this, because you see, you will see things that we just can't land on I simply because of the nature of the subject and the issue. But it, it well, two of them, the mother in heaven, but the one I was looking at was... Uh, <sighs> Anyway, it was the one with the temple and the temple priesthood and the women. Yeah, and, and, and polygamy. I'd love to weigh in on that. Oh, oh boy, <laughs> yeah. with a personal perspective. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We will have you in on every yes, single. Yes, ma'am. Please, <laughs> we need your insights and ideas without question. And and really serious. That that is serious because it is from the man's point. Polygamy was much better on them than the women. I mean, Todd Compton's book in Sacred Loneliness, yeah. uh, George D. Smith's book on Nauvoo polygamy, but we called it celestial marriage. I mean, come on, this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Joseph Smith did a nose dive on that one, man. Crash and burn like Nelson's flight of death. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> which our beloved friend RFM and Bill Real has examined. That so, is such a great episode. Hey, Geoplanet Jane, how you doing? Debbie Donovan, dear. How are you? Lonnie Hansen's here. Richard Pet. I got to say hi to the people. Yeah, I love my <laughs> Elisa Gallien. You know, I've been mispronouncing her name now for a year, and bless her heart, she's never yelled at me. I love that woman. She's wonderful. Let's see. This is Radio Tree Marmot. Oh, no, that's Radio Free Mormon. Hold on. Okay, stop it. Oh, okay. So. He's being very complimentary in the chat of your slides. Yeah. The copious oh, amounts of words you. and punctuation. He's loving it. Yeah, my my punctuation sucks. I, I'm like <laughs> Joseph Smith. I can't write a good sentence. But it's coming from the heart, man. And uh, we're not pulling punches. Well, <laughs> Well, they're making oh, fun yeah. of my shirt too, Carrie. So you're uh, out there. It's all out there. So. I am in the shadow of the temple because I live in Utah. I'm always in the shadow of the temple, but that's right. I can, I can button up the top one, and then it's kind of like my preacher shirt. I can, I can. Do you want me to hand? Do you want me to hand you my hat? <laughs> you want me to hand you my hat so you can cover your shirt? <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I have a comment on the last slide. I think. Oh, I think I'd like to point out that. So as we talked about before, the survey that John DeLynn put together and they literally, you know, collated that they, they put it in a, a hardbound book and they handed it to church leaders. They handed it to Uchtdorf. They said, here, you guys seem to be confused about why people are walking away. Here it is, you know, even the one and two surveys, from right? Yeah, the they put them all together. Themselves. Yes, from the members yeah. themselves, the words. So lest you think it was sin, lest you think it was this and that, we are telling you, we have put this together because, you know, we care. We want questions answered. So this was given to Uchtdorf. And I think that was, we put together a timeline. The John DeLynn survey was in 2011. Um, they had put that all information together in a survey and presented it to apostles by 2012. And then you have 2013. Um, Uchtdorf actually did address that in conference. Do you remember that talk? Yeah, he oh, actually dude. did say there are doubts. Yeah, that, there are that things that happening. Kind of, wow, okay. Yeah. Wow, yeah, it's no. Happened, it's happened. And he then they did. The first I was going to say, of course, then he was 
later executed, not executed, demoted, whatever. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> or, or, executed. Exactly. And, and 2013 is the same year that you have Jeremy Reynolds saying, okay, you guys aren't going to address these questions. I'm going to put these questions out here because they have not been answered. So to me, that last slide, um, if I can decipher it, uh, says that they, they, were, they were aware. They could not, not have been aware um, of these reasons that people were leaving and the questions that they had. And of course, this all became then the impetus to finally saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to write something, right? And what is it they called it, Landon? I can't remember now. They said they were going to, do you remember? They they were going to write, well, I just saw it was the like chat a little, where RFM died. So I was reading the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I told him, I said, if you don't stop this, yeah, I'm going to tell everyone you died. So I assumed he died. I told him, I'm going to tell everyone you died if you don't start harass, stop harassing me with all these fake deaths. Because, you know, I trust RFM people. Knock it off, <laughs> I especially trust RFM. And sometimes, you know, I don't know. <laughs> hey, everybody can I trust, still trust RFM. Him. That's right. That's he right. Man He's man the OG post Mormon. He's the OG. That's right. He, he so anyway, I mean, I just think it's interesting that they received this survey and then they realized they have to do sort of, I think the word was something like a treatment on it, or it was in quotes. I can't remember what it was exactly. A position paper. That's what it was, wasn't it? They were going to put out some oh, yeah, kind of yeah, position, position. Make paper position. on it. Right. Exactly. And so there, there's the birth of the essays right there. Finally. So I just thought it was interesting to get that timeline in place as we go forward and talk about it, that that's when they finally took action after all of this. And but yeah, even yeah, that was problematic. The people who did it. <laughs> who did right, exactly. And and Landon, <laughs> Landon um, downloaded that original survey. And there were some interesting points in that, didn't you think, Landon, just about you know, why people were leaving. I mean, it was, it was very interesting. I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Landon, bring that up. Yeah. That, well, tell us the, about that. that was cool. The interesting thing on the survey as I started looking through the survey was um, number one was the top, the top items that were a concern to the people. And those, those became mostly the gospel topics. Essay. Polygamy was the top one. And I think there's four essays on polygamy. No so, surprise. Yeah. So clearly they had to respond to that. Book of Abraham was number two. They had to respond to that. No Blacks surprise. in the priesthood, DNA in the Book of Mormon. So those are the ones that, you know, we, we get those and they became the gospel topics essays. But there were two that were the very lowest reason for why people leave. And that was uh, leaving to sin and being offended by the church. And yet those are the ones we hear about all the time in the all topics. All the time. So they had the essay, they, they had the results of the essay. They knew that these things are not why people are leaving, that these are the lowest denominators, but these are the things that, you know, that they could point to the members and say, yeah, you're leaving your because fault. of this. Yeah. The other ones, they have to point back at themselves and say, you're leaving because of stuff we told you that's not true. And they didn't want to highlight that. They, they had to highlight the ones that you members Always yeah, making so, the members feel guilty. Yeah. Oh, well, you want to sin. Yeah. Yep. So that was, oh, well, that was and I've, always used, there. I've always used the example sarcastically, and it has offended some Mormons. So I'm going to use it again because <laughs> until, you, until you get the blasted point, I'm going to offend you. It's as if I got offended because someone farted in church. You know, they want they want to give me something stupid. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, there is that unique odor in church buildings. I mean, I wouldn't put it past anybody. I, we you all know, when I go, fart in church. Well, no, do you do? And I think you're desensitized to it as you're attending. But then when you don't go for a while and you go back Ghost at a farewell or something, you're just like, was this always like this? I mean, it's very, it's very distinctive. It, it's the off gassing of the carpet on the walls. <laughs> It's all that rotten spaghetti that the apologists <laughs> have been throwing against the walls for decades and hasn't stuck. It slid down the walls. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Are we insane. having fun yet or what? <laughs> yeah, it's such a fun topic, right? No, oh, it is. Oh, it's, it's a very it interesting just topic. It's better from here without question. Right. So. But then I think it's so interesting that when they, st and let me look at what you said here to see if that's off or on topic. I can't look. Then they start writing the essays. Oh, and do they, Landon, address uh, the questions even in the right order or even at all? This is what I found extremely interesting. 
Jones? So it was actually the the opposite. Um, the things that you would think would be the highest priority essays were the last essays that they produced. So, you know, plural marriage was very far at the end of the essays, even though it was the biggest the biggest concern. And the interesting thing is when I went back and I counted, oh, here's all these, we were short two essays. And so I was like, what, what are the two topics of the two essays? Well, the first one was our Mormon Christians and the other one was becoming like God. And so those are issues that came up in the survey. No one was concerned about those two items. So the very first two essays that we go with don't seem to be anything that's a concern to people or, or a reason that people are leaving. I think most people who are in the church, they're not leaving because they think they're not Christians. That that's a no brainer. And I don't think most of them had a problem with the fact that you could become God one day. That was yeah. part of the doctrine. Well, what, what, made us mad is, what made us mad is when they said, no, we no longer believe you will get your own planet. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> when I become God, I'm creating my own solar That's system. That's why I'm in it in the first place. But they really, the first two essays, they address things that were really criticisms from outside the church towards the church not anything that was leaving people inside the church away. And so I, I look at it like uh, what you do when you, you know, when you, when you start a uh, negotiation or something, you try to go with areas you can agree on. And I think they were trying to oh. kind of say, oh, here's some place, some common ground we can agree on. This isn't a big deal. So that when members started reading the essays, they'd say, oh yeah, there's nothing here to see. You read through the yeah. first two and you're going, well, that's, that's nothing. I, that's nothing to be afraid of. Why are people leaving over this? They wanted to almost make it look like we were leaving over those questions, which they could defend. And then the harder topics seemed to come up later in the essays, the polygamy, the book of Abraham. Those were way back in the release. They, they did these. Well, these Land, to explain Landon's things not first kidding off. either, you guys, because what I did here to put up at least the first page of each one of the essays is you go across the top from left to right. Then you go back over to the bottom from left to right. This is the order of the essays right here. And so you can see our Mormons Christian and then becoming like God. Now it's amazing. They put the book of Mormon in DNA studies third. That was astounding. Maybe it's because in that day is the heyday of Simon Southerton and Thomas Murphy. And, and they were absolutely on everybody's lips. So yeah, but I think yeah it was reactive like that. Yeah. I think they definitely looked at what was going on right then yeah. and had to get and something out right away. Slide, yeah. And on this second slide, we can see all the plural marriage and the book of Abraham and race and the priesthood. So yeah, yeah. Land is not just saying that to try to make a, a phony point here at all. That is correct. I can verify that. So and and we'll show you the uh the URL where the essays are and you're welcome to go to that URL and you can see what Landon is saying. But the again, again, this psychology, it feels manipulative. Mm -hmm. If they really wanted to answer the most serious questions, which ones did you find that didn't you say that weren't you talking about the yeah, most polygamy and book of Abraham were yeah. two they just they had to address they absolutely had to address those race and the priesthood yeah and yet those are the furthest away they they were way further back yep absolutely Right. And they didn't ever address them in public or from the pulpit. I mean, I think when you talk about a, you know, a soft landing or a soft a rollout for these essays, I don't think you understand how soft it was. Like they literally scooted them in. Um, we talked to a woman today whose husband, I think she was in the chat. Yeah. Um, whose husband worked in the ch church history department, who was in charge of working with the, you know, correlation committee, who was putting out essays. There's a difference. There's gospel essays and then there's gospel topic essays. They're different. And and people in the department didn't even know what these were when they appeared. And they were so not known that people would teach from them and then they would get called into the bishop's office. There was a notable case in Hawaii where a teacher taught from these essays and the, the students, you know, in the gospel doctrines class said he is anti-Mormon and he was disciplined for using the gospel topic essays. So now, talk it, about it, hiding it, something. Okay. There was a big key there. Thank you for saying it the way you said it, Rebecca. He was teaching anti-Mormonism. But wait, these are, these are 
the answers to difficult questions, correct? So why would someone get the impression they're anti-Mormon? You remember the response on the web, man, when they first published these. We had people coming out on Twitter and YouTube and all that, and they were saying, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the church website has been hacked. The anti-Mormons have hacked them, and they have embedded anti-Mormon essays in those in on the church's website. We have to warn the church they're in trouble. Why would that be the reaction? Landon, do you have an insight on that? Absolutely, because no one had heard of it before. <laughs> as much as I want to say it. Get more philosophical. <laughs> unless you've watched South Park, you didn't know about the hat and the stone. It just wasn't there. So, yeah, people were going, this isn't the, this isn't the gospel. These guys don't know what they're talking about. Right. Uh, this is a new narrative. And so that that's why they brought it up. And and I think, uh, you know, like I was saying, I think that they tried to inoculate you so you couldn't, they know they know their audience. They know that nobody reads past first Nephi in, in the Book of Mormon, that they all stop by the time they get to second Nephi. And same thing, let's get put out these essays. We'll put a couple in that are not, you know, not very hard hitting or anything first, and no one will get past that to read them. But once people started seeing those, they, it, it was, wait. This is new. I've never heard of this. I didn't know Joseph Smith had 37 wives. We only talk about his loving wife, Emma, all the time. <laughs> Who are these other women? And didn't Joseph Smith teach? Marriage is between one man that's and right. one woman. One wife. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's Joseph the trouble with the essays. It's like, when did you stop beating your wife? I mean, you can say, it's absolutely wrong that Joseph Smith had 75 wives. He only had 30. You know, people are still yeah, like, that wait, was, what? That was freaking so, young, not Joseph. Yeah. You, I mean, you're trying to, and it's too late to inoculate us. It's not too late to inoculate the seminary students. Okay, and now, the younger before people. I lose my trend of thought, we'll get to that, I promise. I don't mean to cut you off, Rebecca. No, no, please. Hold on. My other angle, and that was a brilliant insight, uh, Landon, but my other angle was the reason they saw these essays as anti-Mormon is because this is what the anti-Mormons have been teaching and they got excommunicated for. <laughs> what the hell is the church now saying, oh, well, this is the truth. What kind of implications does that lead? That is horrible. I, I I can think of worse words, but I'm gonna try to be nice. But just wow, ponder that, ponderize that to quote a general authority. That must be the Holy Ghost coming in on me. If the anti-Mormons were the ones teaching this. And now the church is agreeing, well, <laughs> yeah, it is actually what happened. Why have they been excommunicating people who have been teaching the truth and the liars and deceivers have been going to the temple and getting celestial marriages? What the hell is going on? See how tough this is when you take Boyd K. Packer's stupid philosophy and think that you don't tell the truth. You just give the faith promoting stuff. This is the legacy of Boyd K. Packer. Good luck, Mormonism. I'm serious. You're going to need more than just the Holy Ghost to get you out of this shithole because <laughs> you put him in, you sustained him, and you let him become the grizzly bear in the Quorum of the Twelve. And one man overruled all the rest of you 14 pansies that you couldn't control Boyd K. Packer. And now you get to reap the whirlwind. And I promise. We're going to send it to you because this stuff is below our morals. But you're supposed to be the true church. So Carrie, I, I have to say that is a mic nice. drop moment. <laughs> that, that's my Carrie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. 
I'm sorry, I, I had to get that out of me because and that close you know, up was very dramatic. Yeah, I, and I know, I know, John Delin gets emotional, and his audience tells him they hate it when when he gets emotional. But this is emotional because we're talking entire lives here, and and some people can't get over the fact that uh, the psychology is so hurtful because I've wasted my life. It doesn't get given back. Now, now I don't think that way. I'm blessed to being able to study Alan Watts and appreciate his insights. Good thing. Otherwise, I'd be a flipping wreck. But uh, there are some people who need help in trying to uh, get through this incredibly warped <laughs> dynamic of back and forth lying and hiding that we're trying to straighten through and uh, sometimes it's not going to be appreciated. So, but anyway, yeah, that's my diatribe. Landon, you want to say anything else? No, I 100% agree with you. In fact, I think they even quote, I think they even footnote Fon Brody's work in some of the essays. So that it absolutely is the, the people who were excommunicated who they're quoting. Uh, the they, ultimate anti-Mormon, man. Yep. Yes. When, the, when what the anti-Mormon says suits their purpose, like Michael Quinn, they will come back and they will use that quote because it yeah. now supports their position. It's literally the world of the Zaro. I can't add to that. That was really, <laughs> yeah, I, I absolutely ah. agree. So let's take off to the next slide. Hey, we're making it through. We're almost done, really, truly. We're doing it. We don't, we don't mean to go over, but on the other hand, nobody's left. So our audience <laughs> loves it. Oh, Geoplanet Jane, you're awesome, lady. She says rant on, Terry, so I'm going to post it. There we go. I have my audience support, people. And then, look at this, Mo C. It says exactly, Landon. So there you go. Okay, you guys got to say something nice to Rebecca. She's been spot on. I'm not pulling people. in the comments. I'm I'm just not tonight. No, That's okay. Must, I understand. It's all it's right. It's an off night. I get it. <laughs> now, here is my, here is my summary somewhat and okay i've done the mic drop and i'm about to drop the nuclear bomb got so him again <laughs> you guys get ready. we're Make ready because we know it's going to happen any minute Make we are ready up. i'm not done yet i'll try to stay calm i promise <laughs> to be clear as possible to be clear as possible people it is not anti-mormon lies that kills testimony it is mormon leaders lying that does so to be clear as possible, it is not we members who need to repent and receive spiritual renewal in this faith crisis, like Elder Cook says. It is the leaders who need to do so. To be as clear as possible, it is not a faith crisis we members are having. It is a truth crisis the church leaders are having. To be clear as possible, the key, uh, this is for your benefit, church leaders, the key to stopping the members from leaving in total disgust of your phony, correlated, false, faith-promoting narrative is just tell the bleeping truth already. To be clear as possible. The internet has been our salvation at finding truth, not the church leaders continual deceiving and then punishing others for finding they are the deceivers and saying so. We want truth. Stop threatening us for finding it. Again, Elder Oaks, as apostolic as you are, my good brother, you're Full of it. If you think I am criticizing you for making these observations, they are observations. They are not criticisms. I don't say you look funny and that you wear stupid looking ties. I say what you said in 1980 about Mark Hoffman, or 1980, what was it, seven or eight or whatever, what you said about Mark Hoffman was an absolute bullshit lie. Because now we have the evidence. Then we find out, so did you. 
and yet you lied. That's not a criticism. That's an observation. So if you don't like the consequences of us saying things that in your mind are criticisms, then stop doing stupid shit and start being a little more truthful. That's just my honest advice. That dropped the mark. <laughs> anyway, well, here, here. that. <laughs> now we're just drinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, this 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 uh, this subject can get emotional simply because we're so squelched from making any kind of observations, and it is psychologically damaging to us as members of the church, as exmos, as postmos, as pmos, whatever station we're in, right? And so, I'm not trying to turn off my Mormon audience by cussing a little bit, but it got your attention. And that was the point. You need to begin to listen to what we're saying, not what you wish we would say, because we're done worshiping you and giving you ululation and emulation because our morals appear to us to be higher than the church leaders. And that's a crisis, man. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, that's a crisis. It didn't, you know, I wasn't that way as a youth, you guys. I, I sincerely wasn't. We went to conference thrilled to death to sit in the same room as the prophets and the apostles, man. We listened to every word when I was 13. Are you kidding? When I was 13, are you kidding me? I would have much rather been watching football on TV. No. I went to that conference center lots of times and I enjoyed it. But now to find out all of that's just baloney mush, you know, there's, there's going to be some anger here. And that's why these essays are further um, angering is the wrong word, but we're still seeing the buffalo chips where there shouldn't be any as much until we three are going to call that out. Uh, am I off base with that, Rebecca Landon? No, we're going to work through them. And this is quite the list. Um, it's going to be very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to working with you too. You two are absolutely awesome. So, okay. We're almost through this. Oh, oh, oh. And Landon, you had something here too. Let me, this is kind of the picture I'll leave up while you go through this. This is so interesting or, or else you just did. Now this is me. Uh, when I put this together, I said, the issues lied about that seriously matter are the polygamy are the Book of Abraham and are the Book of Mormon, both the DNA issue and the translation issue. How is it that we never heard about the papyri until later? I never was told this in seminary. I was never told. Joseph Smith started polygamy and lived it. Everyone knew Brigham Young was a polygamist and that was just never even talked about. Oh, he did it then, but we don't now. And I never heard of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon with his head in the hat for a very sincere, serious reason. And I'm not kidding, all of the artwork of the church never showed that ever anywhere. Not even in my flip chart that I taught people. So now, Landon, you had something interesting about that. Yeah, well, it seems like uh, that the leaders never lie. It's always the members who uh, misinterpreted it or mistaught something. Uh, but in our in our book club uh, this morning, we were we were reading the book Recovering Agency, and I, I pulled this out of the book uh, that where she quotes, and this is uh, uh, I always it's Bruce R. McConkie's letter to uh, Eugene England. Uh, where he's discussing some of the things he's teaching. And this this just struck me. I highlighted it. He said, Brigham Young erred in some of his statements on the nature and kind of being that God is and as to the position of Adam in the plan of salvation. But Brigham Young also taught the truth in these fields on other occasions. And I repeat that in his instance, he was a great prophet and has gone on to eternal reward. What he did is not a pattern for any of us. We choose to believe and teach the false portions of his doctrines. Um, if we choose to believe and teach the false portions of his doctrine, we are making an election that will damn us. So 
he's saying we can make mistakes we can teach you on truths and we're still going to go to heaven but if you pr propagate any of those lies or misinformation that we taught you you will be damned for it that's stupid because we've been taught everything they say is true so of course we're going to repeat everything you said bruce exactly oh, bruce? exactly <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, taken aback. I went, wow. That is mind-bogglingly <laughs> moronic. He, wow. he, he, he goes on and he, he, he says, uh, uh, according to McConkie, all LDS authorities are exempt. If I err, that is my problem. But in your case, if you single out some of these things and make them the center of your philosophy and end up being wrong, you will lose your soul. <laughs> Bullshit. Bullshit. See, this is the kind of intimidation I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read your whole damn stupid book, Mormon Doctrine, out loud, Bruce. You're the idiot that wrote it. God. Better yet, Carrie, just make slides of Mormon Doctrine. We'll just zip through them. You can probably fit it on four of your slides. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. That's, that's right. Your fans amazing. want your slides, Carrie. Your fans are <laughs> loving your slides tonight. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and again, th this is this is the uh look, let's let's be frank, Frank. <laughs> Remember the mass show where what's their head? Yeah, anyway. Oh, be frank, Frank. Okay. Uh Brigham Young and this polygamy. Now, to do this book of Matt of Abraham. Uh, slide here below in the lower left. I actually had to cover up three rows of his plural wives. There's a whole, whole lot more than that. But I wanted to get this big enough so that you can see this. The hieroglyphics were taken from the papyri and they were used in the Book of Abraham manuscript where the Book of Abraham was translated. Now that's still being argued. Uh, we are all beginning to do deep dives into this and we will continue on. And then of course, Joseph Smith with his head in the hat. So anyway, let's go on to the next slide. So, oh, this is, uh, in, in this essay, they said, you remember they uh, talked about, uh, oh, hey, don't, don't do anything but go to the faithful yeah, stay with the faithful uh, church websites, right? You better stay with the faithful church literature. Don't read anything unapproved, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's so many of us who've been caught in this web of deception uh, through no fault of our own because we've been trying to follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. He knows the way. God, I hate that song. They say they, say they don't brainwash us. And yet they teach our kids to sing that every freaking Sunday. I uh, Wow. I'm not kidding, man. Sorry. I'm on a diatribe. This is an emotion. So I'm, I promise I'll try to be level-headed here. Anyway, there really are. They mention other sources of influence that people have found online, not as a way of encouraging you to rebel. It's not a matter of rebellion. When you're looking for the truth, When you're looking for the truth, it's not rebellion. I absolutely resent and oppose any man in that Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency who wants to try to psychologically intimidate me into silence by saying, oh, well, you're in rebellion, you're in apostasy, etc. I'm looking for the truth. That's not rebellion, Joseph Smith did it. Abraham did it. Peter, James, and John did it. And the backyard professor's doing it. What I'm trying to show you is you don't have to be intimidated by the brethren anymore. You don't because we now know, and it's so unfortunate. I'm not crowing in victory here. We know that ah, they've just chosen the path of being deceptive, okay? So here's the point. There really are sources that are not anti-Mormon sources. They are filling in the information that we've never been given, but should have been. I guess that's my best way. Did I say that all right? Did I say that accurately, you guys? 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. 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 That was very powerful, especially when you leaned way forward. You're definitely getting your point across. <laughs> I, I just want to make sure no one misunderstands. So, And now here is one of my favorite slides. All my dear friends, many of my dear friends, not all of my dear friends, but there are also online sources. Now, here's the other thing. Uh, we've got down here in the left corner, Gerardo, my dear friend, John DeLynn, my dear friend, and then some local yokel stuck in the corner. And right above that perpendicular is my dear friends, Mormonism Live. And over here in the middle is my other very dear friend, Steve Pinecker of Mormon Book Review. And then another one of my dear friends, Nemo, takes up the right corner. And then two of my very dear friends, Mormonish, right up here above Mormonism Live and Steve Pinecker. And we've got We've got Mormon Think, and they do mention Mormon Think. And over here, we've got ex-Mormon Reddit on the left upper corner, and they do mention that. They do mention John DeLynn of Mormon Stories as being the most influential without question. I, I completely agree. And uh, we have Mormonish, who is, so I've added Mormonish, and my friend Steve Pinecker, and my friend Nemo, and Mormonism Live, my dear friends, and Mormon Think, and all. All of these, um, what, what's the proper word for me to call us, you guys? Influencers? I guess we're influencers, aren't we? Whatever. <laughs> the point Bad is... Influencers, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> whether, whether, whether in print or online <laughs> or, or uh, through podcasts and all, we don't care whether you agree or disagree. We're not trying to get you to quit the church. We're not trying to get you to join another church. That is irrelevant. We're just filling in the gaps. We're having fun exploring all of the different views and stuff that were left out because now by what we three are doing with these essays, filling in the information that's missing now the contradictions begin disappearing that gave us our faith crisis. But now there's another problem that rears its very ugly head. And that is, this whole thing looks ridiculous. But that's the price of truth sometimes. <laughs> right? You guys want to say anything? <laughs> You got to get a little ridiculous to get to the heart of the truth. Maybe that's the bottom line. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's the ridiculousness that's going to make this so fun uh, because yeah. you pretty much have to laugh at yourself after. We're laughing on the outside, crying on the inside. Absolutely. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Beautifully said, both of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we've we been here for two hours. We probably ought yeah. to. Before we, before we close out, uh, Rebecca, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I think we should tell everybody what's coming up next. The next time the three of us are together, we will be going over the first essay, and that is Our Mormons Christian. So, and, and to kind of explain this book, um, it's basically, I'll even read this, the contributors to this volume examine the 13 gospel topic essays by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Each contributor is an experienced, thoughtful scholar and many have written widely on religious thought in general and Mormon history in particular. The writers probe the strengths and weaknesses of the Gospel Topics essay to provide um, an illuminating discussion of the salient issues in Mormon history and doctrine. So we're, I would encourage everybody before you join us again, go read that essay. I know we read them before, but read it, read the footnotes, and then we can all dive in together and we'll be talking about what the scholarly treatment in this book is of the essay. And we'll be talking about the essay itself. So go get reading. That's my, Excellent. that's my comment. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you. Landon. I learned a long time ago, give Rebecca the last word always. So uh, I'll refrain. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> well, then from now on, I'll ask you first and her last. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, unfortunately, I get the last word and I get to thank both of you wonderful people for joining me on this. What I'm going to consider is a very exciting quest. It's uh, it can it's going to prove intellectually exciting. It's going to prove, and I know this is almost like a oxymoron or moron it's 
it's going to be a spiritual journey in many regards, uh, not in an organized religious way. But when you when you begin to, there's something exciting, isn't it, about solving a crime. Okay, there I said it. <laughs> solving a puzzle. That was the better word. So so, and this is fun because we're all into the adventure. Everybody likes a mystery, man. And this church is a mystery. I mean, the whole psychology and attitude and methodology of the leaders in just our three lives has, has been really mysterious, weird, not quite the way it could have been done or should have. And so, but the fun thing is finding the, uh, the extra information and knowledge. And I also want to thank our wonderful audience who has stuck with us through the thick and the thin, the silliness, and yet the seriousness, the sincerity, and yet at times the mockery. We all confess, yes, we've had that tonight. We'll probably have it with every podcast. Uh, one doesn't overshadow the other. We're all human here. We're not attempting to insult. We're not attempting to scare. We're not attempting to convert. We are attempting to help us get clear. That's what I want. That's what Mormonish wants. And we can have some fun doing it too. And that's what I, that's what we're doing. So all of you, thank you so much, Rebecca, Landon, all of my audience, you people are absolutely spectacular beyond belief, beyond belief, I tell you. You listen to me because I know now I'm going to ride off into the sunset. Giddy up, little pony, let's go. All right, that's just about all. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I need some it. Jack Daniels after that. Yeah, we both do. Oh my gosh. After show, after show. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.